Okay, without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker and, uh, and let him um, uh, tell us what he has to say. Our speaker today is uh, Doug Bailey, professor of uh, visual archaeology, correct, at, in the Department of Anthropology at San Francisco State University. Um, uh, he probably would not object if I said he's a determinedly eccentric archaeologist because while he uh, does the standard things like field work in the Balkans, including with Ruth early on in Bulgaria and then in Romania in all kinds of interesting and creative ways, and has interests in things like uh, uh, Neolithic settlement and figurines, um, it's probably fair to say that what really is his intellectual passion, uh, uh, maybe more centrally, is expanding archaeology and, and trying to find uh, new work for archaeology, and we'll hear uh, about a lot of that today, but particularly the boundary between archaeology and our history, um, and how uh, archaeologists can be uh, doing sorts of things that uh, actually uh, involve new sorts of production in our own society, maybe that's a fair way to, to put it. Um, but we'll hear all about that, because he's going to give us the intriguingly uh, entitled talk art slash archaeology, a space beyond explanation, the ineligible project. Uh, so before the police come and, uh, <laughs> oh and declare it ineligible, I better turn things over to, uh, to Doug so that he can uh, tell us what he's been up to. All right, All right. great. Thank you very much. Thank Fabulous. It's always interesting to hear. <laughs> always interesting to hear one's introductions. Um, yeah, let's kill those lights. Fabulous. OK. So um, I was just saying to Ruth, uh, that I, the first sort of paper I ever, ever gave at an invited paper was here at Berkeley, and my son was eight weeks old, and he sat in the corner and stole the show. Um, he's now 27, so that's a little bit of a time check. Um, all right, so what you're going to get today is uh, fresh, um, right out of the, the birthing pool, um, about a project uh, we, I'm working on, well, other people in this room are working on, called, uh, the, actually the title of the project is Ineligible, um, although we tried to get some funding recently and they approved the application, but the title, because the title is called Ineligible, they didn't contact us because they thought we were ineligible. <laughs> we did get the money eventually. All right, here we go. So, I'm fascinated by the relationships between art and archaeology and there are all kinds of relationships. So there's a good history of artists who've been working with archaeologists or working as archaeologists. There's also a pretty good history of archaeologists making art. There's nothing new about that. And much of the work that they do is like, ooh, that's quite cool. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. But I'm suggesting, I've suggested in a couple of publications in the last three or four years, that this is subject bounded. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, and so what I've been in investigating, exploring, examining, um, experimenting with is a series of projects that move beyond those boundaries. And um, trying to come towards something which I'm calling an art archaeology, um, which is a, an effective political practice. So, we could all do an archaeology of art. In fact, I made my career starting out as someone studying prehistoric art. And we could do this and fabulous work, really important work. We could, here's Mark Dion's uh, Tate time thing, if you know about this work. Mark Dion, artist, went along the banks of the Thames when the tide was down, collected objects, and created a faux archaeology, pretended to be an archaeologist. In fact, he talks about this as being a dilettante. I'm not talking about this work. We could look at this guy's work, Simon Callery, an artist, British artist, I went and worked um, with archaeologists on a site in Britain um, and was fascinated by the trenches that archaeologists were digging. And so he filled in one of these, or surfaced one of these trenches with um, plaster. And then took that plaster away and made an artwork, made a piece of art that is a representation of that site. And this is, I find this interesting. This is interesting work. Um, not quite sure. It's curious. It's exciting. It's a different take on the past. But I, it still sits within boundaries, disciplinary boundaries. We could look at um, 
Aaron Watson's interesting photographic work. This is his representation of a prehistoric stone circle in Britain. Again, I, I'm fascinated by the way in which he is manipulating or mediating or remediating that site in a way which is outside the boundaries of how we usually understand archaeological description and certainly archaeological explanation and interpretation. But really the aha moment, which I didn't realize I was having it when I was having it, was in Portugal in 2000 at an at a EAA conference. Um, and there was a paper, it wasn't a paper actually, it was a sound event. And this is really hard to hear. We've got it, we've got it cranked all the way up and I'm, <coughs> so if you just stop chewing your Pringles for a second. You all hear that? This is a composition made from sounds of prehistoric stone tools. So there's no, no attempt here to say this is what happened in prehistory, although Ian Cross and Ezra Zubro do publish about that. They call them lithophones. This is actually making creative work today using objects from the past. And I heard this and I was like, whoa. This is not about explanation or interpretation. This is creating something brand new, which sits outside of the boundaries both of archaeology and I would suggest of music and of art. It sort of works in a third space. All right. Here's another piece of work by the British artist Claude Heath, who does something he calls blind drawing. I don't know if that's a politically correct way to call it, but that's his term. He takes objects, he, blind, he gets blindfolded, and he has an object in one hand, he can't see it, and he draws it with his other hand. So his sense of that object is only through touch. And this is his reading of the Venus of Willendorf his interpretation of it, if you will. It's an artistic output, it's creative, doesn't intend any interpretation or explanation, but I'm, I, this excites me. I have weird interests, as you can see. We took Claude to Romania on a project we were running, funded by the EU, and we asked him, we cut him, we had, let him loose in the museum, and he made a series of works doing this technique of blind or unsighted drawing. So this is his artwork based on that half, that half did Neolithic ads, lithic ads from 6,000, 4,500, 5,000 BC. We came back from the field one day and he'd taken a early Neolithic core, beautiful blade core, probably 5,900 Cal BC. <laughs> he put it in a, a bowl of ink, and then took it out and started making art with it. We were worried the museum were going to throw us out. They didn't. Luckily, they were into it as well. So, so there, and there are lots of other examples I can show you of Claude's work. Um, some of you will know a project I worked on in um, 2009, 2010 called Unearthed, based in the UK at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, in which we were trying to work with figurines, my area of interest, specialism both Balkan, East European, but also Japanese, Joman, prehistoric figurines. But the goal was really to do it in a different way, not to just write a catalog of an exhibition and, ex and present explanations and chronologies and typologies. So we had an exhibition in which we mixed and matched prehistoric artifacts and modern cultural material like Barbie dolls, um, bonsai trees. We had an exhibition, um, published a book, um, and I won't spend too much time talking about that because I've done that here before, but just to give you one example, this is the work of Sean Caton, a perform British performance artist. We gave him to hold these Jomon Japanese prehistoric artifacts and said, go for it, make work. And he made these beautiful paintings and pastels and gouache and all kinds of things, and he also wrote this wild narrative. 
heavy, filmy eyes, fervid and gluey slumber. And then the bottom, blood spirals, milk spirals, sperm spirals, mix and spin. Well, the museum there wasn't into this. Good thing they didn't control the publication. So the, the book exists as this strange mixture. So things are starting in my mind of ways, new ways of working with materials. Same project, unearthed in the Norwich exhibition on the book. We gave some of these figurines to a Japanese photographer, Kuoshima Tsunaki, and he decided to make negative prints of them. Sure, why not? But the coolest thing is that he sort of activates these objects in ways which they've never been activated before. They seem to have life and light spilling out of them. Unexpected result. Doesn't have any interpretive explanatory. It's not about um, publishing a journal article, but it's actually fascinating work, which I think pro pushes us beyond boundaries. Other work, I've published a bunch of weird montage chapters in otherwise traditional archaeological anthologies. Um, and played with ideas of text and image. Again, not to make an argument in text, but to probe and expand the dimensions of what we do and how we think. And the most recent of those, there are four or five of them in publication. The most recent one came out in this book. Has anyone seen this book? It's out recently. Time and History and Prehistory. I did something really strange with how different animals perceive the passage of time. And then throughout the article, all these footprints, it's crazy. Just check it out. I'm not going to waste our time with this today. And I want to show you one other project which I worked on before I get on to this new project. So I'm just trying to set the scene now a little bit. I was running a project in Eastern Europe, in Romania, working in early Neolithic pit houses or pit structures. Um, funded, major project. Uh, but as we moved through the project, I felt less and less confident that what we were doing perhaps held any validity that I can write a book and articles about what happened 6,100 Cal BC years ago. So I ended up write, wrote a, writing a very different book in which I looked not at pit houses, but at the process of cutting holes. And I looked at three major artists, Lucio Fontana, Italian post-war artist who was famous for slashing and puncturing canvases, Gordon Matta Clark, American um, artist of the 60s and 70s, and his work in Paris, Conical Intersect, in which he cut holes through buildings, and the work of Ron Athey, um, whose performance art in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, in 1994, in which he cut the back of an uh, African-American man who was HIV positive with a razor blade and F symbols loosely tied to African um, tribal marks, blotted the blood with paper towels, then ran the paper towels on clothesline out over the audience. Almost led to the defunding of the National Endowment for Arts. But fabulous work. So all three of these artists work on cutting holes in surfaces. And that's another project. And there's a book out there which you can check out if you want to. So I wrote the book. You know, you do that. And there's the book and there's the table of contents. All nice. Big press. Yay. All that stuff you're excited about. But I realized that this really wasn't enough. I'm still within the boundaries of my discipline. I'm still within the limits. Since the book was about cutting holes in the surface, in the ground, whether you're in the Neolithic, or whether you're in post-war Italy, or whether you're in Paris, I decided I had to cut the book. So I made 50 artist versions of this book, in which I cut holes, various holes through different parts of the book to make the point that we can write and talk about these things a lot, but until we start doing stuff, making things, we're still within our disciplinary boundaries. And there's nothing wrong with our discipline. I'm just trying to look over that wall. And so I sent a bunch of these out. Ruth, you have one of these, don't you? No, you had to send me one. How is that, pos <laughs> how is that possible? I don't know. I'm sure, I offered to send you one. Cut her out. I cut her out, thank you, that's excellent. <laughs> Perfect, man. Um, but then I realized I needed to do something else. Because I think if we write about stuff, like action, agency, whatever you want to talk about it, you've got to find some way to do it. 
So if you're writing about the impact holes have in the ground or in a building, you should put some holes in your work and see what happens and see what the effect is. I found that a lot of what I wanted to do involved going out and making things happen as opposed to just perhaps talking about it. Okay, enough about me. Um, had an email from a Portuguese sculptor about four or five years ago. She was doing a dissertation, PhD dissertation, on the interaction of art and archaeology. And she'd read a few of my things, and she sent me this email and said, would you mind looking at my application for my PhD? Happy to have, you know, you, we get these things a lot. And depending what time of day they come in and what day of the week it is, you say sure or not. And I think for all graduate students and young academics, always say yes. Because you never know what's going to happen. So this woman is making these outrageous over life-size versions of these prehistoric Romanian figurines. And that in itself was cool enough. But she and I are now um, curating an exhibition which opens in Portugal on March 6th, runs the end of June, which is gonna have three installations. One of them is of her work, so check this out. She made this incredible figurine, incredibly complex. If you're a ceramicist, try to make something that large. Before she, found, she, before she tried to even fire it, she decided she should break it into pieces and cut it up. So she did that, and then she's fired the pieces, and part of her installation is gonna be about the pieces of this figurine which never got fired. Don't know what's going on there. But I'm excited about the stimulation that that brings to me in thinking about what we do. We'll get back to Sarah Navarro's work in a minute. More recently, um, anybody go to TAG in Syracuse? Excellent, I can say anything I want. No one will. <laughs> um, was that a session about art and archaeology? So I said, well, what should we do? And we had been, I had started working with artifacts from San Francisco, specifically those excavated before they built the Trans Bay Transit Center, and had been given 52 boxes of these objects, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Anyway, this amphora came from the excavations. Paleo West, I think it's called, the company's called Paleo West now. I think it was called something else before, or it's changed its name. We didn't That was before. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, so they, a um, bunch of artifacts they gave to our university as teaching or research tools. And this is one of them. So I took this to um, Syracuse. And I just want to play the little video on, that's on Vimeo at the moment. Oh, oh no, why is it not on the screen? Oh, because it's a link. Oh my God, another of these links going to show up. That would really be a bummer. Um, but if not, don't worry. We'll, we'll, I've, so, yes? And then run it here? Uh, drag it out of the window? Yeah. If I come out of PowerPoint, which I'm out of. Uh, okay, and then I drag the other screen. If I go to my, there we go. There, how's this? Perhaps do something else. 
And um, I, I think what I want to do, what I'm excited about is all the work I do is releasing things. So um, I don't know what the right tool is. And um, Okay, we don't need any more of that. I think you get the idea. Let's pop back to here. Slideshow, play for current slide. Um, and what we did with this Amphora, we're on, is that um, people at the session adopted sh shards and took them home and then started to respond and send in, um, in fact, Ruth, I think this is your, that's, my Sophie. that's your little shard there. Sure. There's one looking over the Hudson. I'm not quite sure. I think that's Randy um, up in, Randy and Ruth up in Binghamton. Um, and there's a, a Facebook page. People send in their pictures about what their, sh what their shards are doing today. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So all of this was sort of interesting and exciting, but it really didn't get me to the place. I don't know, there was something missing. So I went back to some work I was just publishing at the time. This is an article that came out in 2017 in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, which I've tried to define this thing called art archaeology, which I'm interested in doing. And it has three principal moments. Disarticulation, you break the object from its past. You remove it from that currency. You say it's no longer of value as an artifact or even a, an element of the past. You then repurpose that material you treat the result, the broken shards of that pot, as raw material, as if you're an artist, as if you're using pigment or plaster or marble. And then you make a piece of work, you create something which has some disruptive potential. You make work that intervenes politically in some issue or debate. And perhaps the best example of this, although it's not archaeological, comes from Kent Monkman's work. Does anyone know about Kent Monkman's work? Okay, thank you, good. So if you went to Stanford Cantor Museum two or three years ago, you'd have seen this beautiful painting on the wall. And you know, we're used to this sort of art historical tradition, right? And this is Monkman's work, History is Painted by the, by the Victors. It's this huge landscape, American West. Yeah, 18th, 19th century. And if you walked in and you looked at it, and if you didn't look too closely, you'd say, oh, look at the trees and the mountains and the water. This is of this incredible tradition of the empty landscape of the West. But if you look a little closer, there's some weird stuff going on here. Now, Monkman took an original object, Albert Bierstadt's painting, disarticulated from its context, repurposed it to make his own painting, which then had a really quite specific political intention. Because if you zoom in at the strange painter in his, his or her hip-high, almost leather boots, and you look at the screen, or the painting that this, this um, where am I? Well, we, mischief egotistical, mischief egotistical. This is Kent Monkman's alter ego in his art. And among many other issues which Kent Monkman has engaged has been the Euro-American destruction of this continent specifically in terms of sexuality. And this painting is important because it's the Sioux artist Red Horse's 1881 um, work about the victory by the Lakota at, a, at the Battle of Greasy Grass, which we may know, also know as the Battle of Little Bighorn. But of course, the painting is ripped through with all kinds of other imagery, which make important statements about um, homoeroticism, about um, the exclusion of native, non-traditional sexual categories of gender. So Monkman is a really good example of doing this three-part thing. Disarticulation, repurposing, and disrupting. 
me show you another project. This I talked about at length two years ago when I was here, so I'll just give you a couple slides, literally slides. It's a box of our archive from San Francisco State. Had a huge ethnographic anthropological archive there. Um, much, very long story about how it was closed down through incompetence and lack of funding. But there was a set of slides which someone tried to throw away when this museum got closed. And we took those slides and looked at them and realized that the slides had been selected for a really specific set of, one might say, disturbing image sets to do with, um, as an anthropologist, as a visual anthropologist, a tradition of anthropology which we no longer practice, of head shapes and face shapes and ethnographic origin or sexual orientation, dissections of animals, um, x-rays of nine-month pregnant women. Um, very disturbing dissections up at the top. And the question was, what do we do with these objects? And one of the result, or the thing that, one of the ways in which I dealt with this is to take these objects, just like that amphora, <laughs> and to suggest that we needed to release them from the context from the containers in which they'd been, they were being held. And so at a project funded by the um, Norwegian Academy of Sciences in Oslo in 2017, um, we dissolved in bleach a lot of the images off of the plastic supports of these slides in a way of trying to liberate those individuals who had been trapped within that archive. And there's a whole literature on archives and releasing, which we can talk about perhaps some other time. But what we realized when we were doing this, and this was not our intention, we had no idea. But as the bleach removed or liberated that pigment, the dyes from the plastic support of the slide, it was almost as if that individual was being transposed into another medium, into a liquid. And the more we thought about this, the more we started to think about how that individual was being released back into some other format, out of that entrapment in an anthropological study. All right, so that's been 30 minutes of getting us set up. Now I want to talk about this new, so all that stuff is done, we can talk about that some other time, there are publications out there. I want to now talk about this project called Ineligible. Now as all of you who live here know, um, There's something called the Trans Bay Transit Center, which is now reopened. Um, but of course, in advance of its construction, there was a series of archaeological excavations. In fact, there's an image from one of the trenches. And the material from that excavation um, was uh, processed appropriately, site, um, detailed report written up. In fact, that's uh, the offices of um, Paleo West in Walnut Creek uh, a year and a half ago. All the boxes, many of the boxes from this site. And in, in working with these materials, and this is not something that would be new to many of you, there were determinations made by authorities, by people with archaeological knowledge and experience, but what objects should be retained for study and those which could be stored or gotten rid of. And those that could be stored or gotten rid of were deemed not to have historic value or duplicates, and they were called ineligible. Christina Alonzo, who had done the master's degree at San Francisco State, was working at Paleo West and offered us some of these materials as teaching aids, fabulous resource. So we took loads of them. In fact, I'm here, well, I'm not in the picture, but I'm loading 52 of these boxes in the back of a U-Haul van to drive across the bay to put into um, to put into a, a room in our department. And then we started working with the students about how you categorize these objects. How do you process them? <clears throat> and here we are, this, we're now in San Francisco State. We've got a group of students. In fact, there's the amphora. You can see it, yep, right there. But there are lots of other, inter lots of interesting objects. But all these deemed to be ineligible, not of importance for the report or for the knowledge of San Francisco, et cetera. At about the same time, I had another email from my Portuguese sculptor friend, 
Sarah Navarro. She said, I've just been contacted by the museum. This museum is the International Museum of Contemporary Sculpture in Santo Terzo in northern Portugal. Would you like to co-curate an exhibition with me? Something to do with ineligible. I said, absolutely. Absolutely. I said, what are, the, what are the constraints? She said, there are no constraints. You can do anything you want. So quickly, we put together a set of kits, assemblages of those objects, and sent them out to people, to artists, to archaeologists, to creators, to interested parties. And we said, here's the list, of the instructions that went out with the objects. We asked people to take these objects and treat them as raw material, as if they are pigments, or sand, or marble, or wood, or acrylic, or oils. And to make, make any work you want, but it has to engage in some way, either with San Francisco and its current energies and problems, like the tech revolution, disenfranchisement, homelessness, or houselessness, or it has to engage with one of your, your own personal reaction to the assemblage, or to your own personal, professional, or local political experiences, desires, and frustrations. We said, I want you to make new work <clears throat> using these objects as raw materials. I had no idea what was going to happen. No idea. Expected most people to say, this is ridiculous. So I'm not going to spend the, next, the last part of our talk showing you the stuff that's just come back. And literally, some of these images came in by email yesterday. So I hope I got it in order. We sent some work to Lena Host Madsen and Thomas Anderson, as an artist, both in Denmark. And the assemblage they got were a bunch of pipes. And as you're going to see, those students working in our lab at San Francisco State, processing the materials, I said to them, rip them out of their context. Throw away the tags. I want you to rearrange them just by material. So what did uh, Lena Host Madsen and Thomas Anderson do? Well, they had a bunch of pipes. And their medium was sculpture. So they made something called pipe fruit. And I'm going to read out what they said. This is all they said about it. They said, I got a number of old pipes from the train station. The result was this fruit from the pipe tree, known to grow in Central America, though now pretty rare. OK, I, I'm sort of in an interesting shape. I can see something like that in all the galleries in Berkeley and other places. Next set. Sent out to Vanessa Woods. Vanessa Woods is an artist here in San Francisco. And there's the, some of the artifacts, we, the assemblage we sent out. And she made these collages. And I'll read what she said. This is her text writing about her work. So she treats herself in the third person. The collages that Vanessa Woods created for an eligible play with subversion, classification, and fantasy to imagine a lost civilization that lived where the San Francisco Transbay Terminal is today. To create this work, Woods combined collage material from diverse histories, cultures, and populations with high resolution scans of the archaeological artifacts and bones. Using anthropological met methodologies, the work also aims to explore the idea of other and the tradition of Western ethnographic interpretation poised between scientific objectivity and moralistic storytelling. Invented idols, imagined rituals, and reconfigured symbols collapse fact and fiction. Here's an assemblage we sent out to Cynthia Nunzio, an independent artist in Lisbon. A bunch of rusted pieces of metal. She's a weaver, so she created a tapestry in which she inserted many of these materials. Here's another set of objects sent out to someone in this room who made a work called The Passage of Moving Through. It's Ruth's work. And I'll read one short quote from Ruth's extended text that she sent me. Obviously, I'm thinking about the challenges and disappointments of immigrants globally, and especially in the US. The 1913 newspaper skin contains articles that mirror this and other issues such as the glass ceiling of employment promotion and career paths for women and other minorities in the workplace, in which a hopeful start and apparent progress are stifled by locked doors, through which only a few, those who can reach the keys, can pass. Here's another set of work sent out to Gavin McGregor. Gavin McGregor is a British um, archaeologist. I'm trying to find my notes. Here we are. Yes. 
Gavin McGregor took these objects, and of course he broke them up and smashed them, created a piece of work. You may recognize this image. The snow globe, playful, a light mesmeric flurry, perhaps evoking childhood memories. But the material is too dense to float. It rapidly sinks to the base, an affront to the promise of cost-free pleasures. It may lead to short-term disappointments or frustration. And he goes on to write in more detail about the role of the snow globe and the imagery he uses. Here's another one called Decadence by Jessica Barina, who is at the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Lisbon. Now, I'm wondering whether this is going to run, whether I need to come out of. No. So Jessica bang, mashes up these ceramics, mixes them with um, cement and other materials, and is making a series of building materials, bricks and pillars. And she writes in detail, I won't read out now for lack of, we don't have enough time, about the ways in which buildings and walls in Lisbon are being torn down and rebuilt um, to erase local historical traditions. Here's another one. Um, Colleen Morgan of this institution um, but who's now at the University of York, she received this object and, whoops, let's see if this plays. No, it doesn't, hang on, time out, stop. Let's come out of this. And let's go into this and let's hit it here. Children's items more than other. She took the leather fragments and gave them to different people to speak about them, to tell stories about them. In fact, by the end, she is <laughs> So Colleen Morgan's work is a piece of video, um, a bit of performance, if you will. Um, and there's a longer text that goes with it, which I won't spend the time to read out in full um, at the moment. Okay, I'm going to skip one or two of these just for time. Um, so I want to get to this guy. Remember the person who did those strange drawings in pastel with the words about blood and sperm, Sean Caton? Sent him this set of dolls. And this is the work he made. And I'll read out if I can find it. Yeah, he says this is a short film loop which uses figurines called frozen charlottes made in Germany in the mid-19th century. And he talks a lot about the ways in which bodies, female bodies, child, children's bodies are exploited and presented through different media. A couple more I want to show you. Um, Alfredo Gonzalez Ribal, I'm sure many of you followed his work, I hope. Um, and I will read out the text for his. If I can just put my hands on it. Yes, I can. So Alfredo takes these keys. I'll just paraphrase. Please, and he takes them out into the landscape. And if you know Alfredo's work about the Spanish Civil War, he takes these keys and works on this concept of key. He finds it goes to a famous site of massacre in the Spanish Civil War, breaks the keys up, and buries them in the ground. And there's a, a much longer text and a much longer, so there are 18 different photographs. So again, took an object, 
disarticulated it, made new work which had um, political importance in state. Okay, two more examples. This is a work by a um, Finnish, um, I think he's a PhD student actually at the moment, Marco Marilla. And his work is called The Hum. We sent him these bones, and of course he crunched them up, um, took the crunched pieces, put them in little cups, put them in uh, 800 degrees centigrade oven for two hours, ground up the bone results, so all fitting with the art archaeology thing, and then his creative work, I think I'm gonna have to come out of this again, but let's see what happens. Yeah, let me come out of the... Hang on, hang on. There we go. So this is his work, which he titles The Hum. And while well, this is running, let me read what he says. Well, I won't let you listen, actually. So obviously that dust is the ground up burnt bone. And he's fascinated by this concept there, that there is some noise that exists at all time in the world, in the past and in the present, in the prehistoric past and in the modern present. And he's making work with that noise and with these objects. Okay. And I want to finish with um, one example, because I want to leave a few minutes for conversation. So I'm going to go to the final one, which was our title uh, slide. So these are the bones we sent out to, or the objects we sent out to Laurent Olivier in Paris. I think many of you may know Laurent's work. And this is what he wrote upon receiving these objects. And his work is called Remember Wounded Knee. When I saw those brown bones all alike and industrially butchered, I was stroked by their strange blind faces deprived of mouth. I put them back on their feet. They are standing, asking silently for something into a savage language that we can't hear. They are the invisible victims of this unbearable violence that turns the earth into a desert and people into nobodies. They are the ghosts of the American past, the evidence of its present. This is the terrifying face of this country, which is so full of rage and defiance, the immense sadness of its landscape, which is inhabited by sorrows and distress. This is Wounded Knee, the huge red stain on the stars and stripes that no one sees. All right, I'm gonna leave, that's my last example, um, but I will say that there are links um, to a website called Art Archaeologies, where much of this work is and where more work is uploaded every week. There's a Facebook page which provides highlights and um, notifications of new work being posted on Art Archaeologies. That's just the Facebook page Art Archaeology. You can find me at dwbailey at sfsu.edu um, or you can get me through my department. So I've left three and a half minutes for discussion. I hope that's not too little. But we can pop the lights up. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Doug. Um, it's really great to see the outcome of some of this um, exploration and um, conflict of interest statement. I have an assemblage from the ineligible project under my party. So. Okay. <laughs> as much about the articulation of things which do not 
belong together mm -hmm. as they were the breaking apart or decontextualizing of things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that decontextualizing things has a particular political place, especially in conversations about history and identity, et cetera, and articulation is being used, for example, by indigenous scholars as a way to reclaim mm -hmm. some things that have been erased. So I wonder what you think about that. I think you're absolutely right. So I think that once the, once the disarticulation happens, or the decontextualization, or the breaking off, then anything is fair game. And yes, this is a lot of juxtapositioning and articulation. And to be honest with you, it's a little bit of a cheat because there is a thin, there's an undercurrent which still drives the power of some of this, that these, this material came from something which is old. But I completely agree with you, yeah, absolutely. Yes? I shouldn't want to move on maps, but I'm going to. I find your whole concept to be very male. Okay. And very egotistic. Hmm. And I don't appreciate it whatsoever. Okay. As someone who has cherished and worked with antiquities for 50 years, I think it's audacious to destroy anything you find without having any respect for the fact that it's lasted that long. Gandhi took fragments and put them into beautiful works. You're destroying things. What? How dare you? I, I respect that opinion. I don't think you do, but it's fine for my opinion. Ruth. Um, I have two responses, actually one to um, yours, but um, one of them is about that these materials, what would have happened to these materials, these um, ineligible materials, if they hadn't come to San Francisco State? And it's about what do we do with all these materials that are excavated? You mm -hmm. know, where it is something that we're very... Um, very yeah. sensitive to be, having just got rid of a lot uh, or we evolved. No, 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 sorry, that's a secret. <laughs> I'm supposed to know that. But anyway, the, um, it is, it seems to me, when I saw those boxes at San Francisco State, my main thought was, thank God, what are we going to do with yeah. all this stuff? Right. What should be done with it? And now I'm thinking about my own thing, which is too big for Lisbon. <laughs> And anyway, it's um, not, very, not a very hygienic thing to have been based in wood, living, almost living wood. So, you know, do I, what do I do with that? Where do I put that? I can't just well, put it in the garbage bin. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like it, I've, I've, I've recorded it, I've documented it and so on. What do I do with it now? So that's one, one of my, so that, you know, you can't keep all right. of these so-called antiquities. Right. So can we deal with that one first? Yes, before you? So yeah, this is a pro anyone who's run any excavation, millions and millions of objects. Many of them, we decide, or go into a box and go into a storage, and maybe a PhD student will come along. Or, but the reality of that, I think, is that I have thousands, tens of thousands of objects in a museum in Romania. I convince them to keep all the coursewares. They're sitting there. And they will sit there probably until that museum falls down. It's a, it's a fundamental problem. And I think it actually asks an existential question about archaeology. What is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? Are we justified in doing it? Are we justified in doing all that we're doing? Because there's, there's a more responsibility when you excavate a site to curate that collection. Um, and funny, when I've given this talk in earlier iterations of it, um, some people feel relieved that, oh, here's something which these objects can be used for, which has some value, an artistic value, that they're finding a place um, for whatever, whether that, and it, it is disturbing, and I, I'm sorry that the former questioner left, because that's an important, really important debate. And I think it's a debate I'm engaging, and I'm excited about engaging. Um, and I am, it's me, so, okay, you go. But, um, I, I, this, this is an issue. I don't, know, I don't know that there is a good answer to this, yeah. but I think we, sh we need to be talking about this. There isn't a single answer. Right, there isn't. There's something that has to be, but it does have to be looked So Paleo West was excited to get rid of this stuff. Whew, someone's going to take it off our hands. Yeah. And they signed the paperwork legally 
to give us the right to use it as teaching research. And I said what I was going to do with it, and they said, wow, that sounds interesting. Send us a link. Put us in the credits. So uh, what I don't understand is it was excavated in San Francisco yes. on somebody's property, or the city of San Francisco's property. Well, I think there are a whole bunch of different properties okay. that Transbay pro exists on. Right, right. In San Francisco. Do those, do those properties don't own them? They were given to Paleo West in perpetuity. You, you dig it up, you take it away, because normally things belong to the place they came from, yeah. meaning they go to a museum, right. local museum, or they right. go back in the ground in that, right. on that site. I mean, so why did these things not go back in the ground? Well, you've been, have you been to the Transbay Transit Center? There's no ground to put them in. Well, there is some ground somewhere there. I mean, it's still a place. You know, Christine, that's absolutely a really good idea to, to, to re- Paleo, yeah. Why Paleo West? Paleo West. West. Yeah. Own, own the stuff. I mean, that's the part that's new to Well, I would have to look at the legal documents you know that they negotiated with the city. When you dig something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those well, I think that what, so the reason, the fascination about type, I'm sorry? They don't, that, yeah. Then the transportation rule is partially funded by Salesforce, and they don't want any of that. So they said, and whatever you dig up, take away. And no, no, they didn't say that. They said, we're going to, you, you will decide as a professional archaeologist what is eligible to be retained and studied and presented and curated. By making that decision, you're going to create a category called ineligible, and we, no one cares about that material. And what I'm saying in calling the project ineligible is that, wow, there's a potential in, in eligibility to make new things, to create new things, which doesn't fit in the archaeological logic or the an archaeological ontology of what we should do. I completely get it. It does. I don't want it to fit in that. I want. To, I'm looking for some new space which turns its back and violates some of the some of the norms, which I respect those norms. So yeah, and that's part of the date. That's part of the argument, the danger, and the reaction. Yeah, but yeah, I don't. I, I want to get outside of that ontology. So there have been a hand up in the back for ages. Ah, interesting, yeah. Very interesting, yeah. When I started talking to artists about this, they said, this is how artists work. We're going to tell you what we want to do. We're going to tell you the theme we're going to work on. And we're then going to select the materials we want to use to make that work. And I said, OK, I'm not doing that. I'm doing something which is outside of the artistic ontology of how you plan to do work. And some people said, we don't want to do that. And I said, OK, I'm with you. No worries. Um, so we made the selection based on material, based on physical material. So all the rusty metal bits are in one big container. All the plates are in one big container. All the bones are in another big container. That's what the students were doing. They were disarticulating it out. But that was, a, it, was an, it was the same ontological clash, which I had with the arche my archaeological call and myself and thinking about how I was raised as an archaeologist. But I wanted to have, to me, that clash was a sign of we're, getting, we're going somewhere else, some third space outside of both of these disciplines. And therefore, the rules we have used in both these disciplines, we have to set aside for a moment to participate in this project. Good question. Yeah. I have something that jumps off of that. Um, so part of the premise of this is, is taking things out of context. Yes. Right? OK. And then you call these groups that you create assemblages, Okay. which of course are other big loaded archaeological terms. Um, where in fact they're not actually assemblages in the sense that none of these things were yep. necessarily found together. And like you were explaining how you divided them by yeah. material, what was that? I mean, what, why rather than giving someone something random that really was, even mm -hmm. if it was a false assemblage or mm -hmm. a random mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. why would you necessarily choose to put right. things by material rather than a different selection? Of Great question. And we, when we started doing this, we weren't sure quite how we were going to deal with this. Mm -hmm. um, we thought about keeping them within their closed context assemblages. In fact, when we sent them out, we called them kits. Okay. Kit 1 to kit 85. Okay. Um, but your point is, is, is taken. And I think that there came a point when we had to decide, how are we going to send things out? And if I went back and thought about this idea of we're going to treat it as raw materials, as you would as in an artistic studio, before you do your articulation, your juxtapositioning, well, you squeeze you know, your acrylic out of a tube. It's, it's, it's in your box of paint. So that's a material. It's a medium which shares some coherence. So I said, OK, that's what we're going to do. 
And we made the decision over a couple days and talking about it and saying, okay, let's, let's group them by raw materials and send them out because that seems like, if you went to an art, I went to an art store and said, how do they sell things? Here's the balsa wood section, here's the paint section, here's the oil section. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go with that. But I mean, it could have gone other ways. Well, it might be, there might be an argument for doing a more mixed media type of thing. Like, some kits could well, in fact be to be, to be completely the because the artist who would normally want a single material yes. would have to deal with the fact that in fact- Well, to be done. honest with you, um, you know, what Ruth, Ruth came and selected hers. I was going to say, yeah. Annie yeah, came, you, so, you came and selected yours. <laughs> So some, some people yeah, who are local, people who are local to the Bay Area came and selected. Yeah. And they just, I just said, go into the room and take what you want. And everything that the people who came was a mixture of different materials. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I wanted, I didn't want that to happen. Actually, I, I, I didn't want well, that to happen. Well, it was a random selection, too, of what helped people would deal with. I, I actually chose, and, and because of that, yeah. it was really, really difficult for me because of the things I'd chosen to decontextualize. Yeah. And, and I wanted to force people, yeah. From what I knew all went together, one of the things I chose, actually two, several of the things I chose were shoes, because as an archaeologist yeah. I've never been allowed to have yeah. shoes, you know, because yeah. they're the one thing that never survived. But I specifically didn't want that, I didn't want people to get a box of stuff which they could relate so, to. Right, yeah. I wanted them to go in blind. Throughout the project, that slowed me down, I couldn't, I, I Thank you. couldn't get away Thank you. That, that, it makes me feel better. <laughs> the, the final step of the art archaeology process yeah. is, is, is the, uh, having the uh, decontextualized, mm -hmm. repurposed things do political work, yeah. I guess. And as I particularly watched the, the, the film clip of the calcined bone dancing and making these yes. beautiful patterns, yes. respond, I mean, that was an aesthetic experience. Yes. Not for me, a political one. Right. I mean, is it just your choice that it should do political work? I suppose yeah. the artist just wants it to do aesthetic work. I mean, can you really important question. So, of of the, we sent out eighty five kits. Um, there are twenty eight pieces in the show, um, in in Portugal. Um, some of those pieces have some clearly political edge, or they speak to something. Many of them do not, um, and. In the, we had a great, we were discussing with the museum what information we want to give to the spectator, the visitor, and half, some of the team wants it just to be title or untitled, no other information, and people have to react to things from their own personal experiences. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that perspective. Another part of the team, which I'm also sympathetic to, is to use QR codes, which people scan with their phones, and they get either a text or, or a video or an acoustic thing, which fills in some of the background of what the maker, for example, Marco, who did the vibrating bone thing, talks a lot about this, the role of the hum in our society and electronics and digital era, and is this a problem and a, we need to, so that's his political show on it. Everyone sort of can work their stuff into something. The, the woman who wove the, the nails into the tapestry, she writes in her text two paragraphs about her personal feeling rejected as an unattractive woman in Portugal and how making this beautiful piece of work with something which is seemed to be unattractive, a rusted nail, speaks to that. Now looking at that piece of work, I can never, I will always be an archeologist trained as one. I, I don't get that, but what's to say that you have to get something from the piece of art? I think everything has to speak to people in a different way. I think that's part of what I like about the art archeology. span It gets away from saying result, interpretation, explanation, data point. Analysis. Oh, there's lots of interesting experimental archaeology that goes on. I don't mean experimental archaeology like making flint. I mean, um, what, would I, what do I mean? I mean, archaeologists doing weird stuff. Yes. But yeah, that, that's a really, and it's, it's a hard one. And some of, we got back 48 works, 50 works, and we had to make a set of decisions about what do we include in this show or not. And one of the criteria that we used was is there some political, social issue? which in some way it engages. And the pipe fruit one I showed you first off, the artist, they said, no, we just we wanted to make this, it looks cool. I'm like, absolutely, that looks really cool. But it doesn't really fit into, if you want to be really strict right, about it. Tumor. Exactly, 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 yeah. So these are, these are the huge issues we've been wrestling with. Yeah. Meg. I think that's 
that's the foundation. And when we think yeah. we've got things in context. We, we decide what context is. We decide what objects to take out of the ground and what to leave. And I think in my excavations in Romania, I gave up on interpreting that site and wrote that book with the holes in it because I said, I'm fooling. I am, this is a bit of a, a scam to tell people that I know what happened. I mean, I can make a story which has scientific facts that support it, but that's my, I use trowels and I use shovels and I use micromorphology. Why? Uh-huh. Uh, what we come to value and how we change what we value and then the implications that that has it sort of actually overdetermines everything else that we do. So uh -huh. uh, looking at this in yeah. a bigger picture uh, mm -hmm. that it really is, I mean, certainly that's what's happened with art as mm -hmm. a concept in anthropology mm -hmm. is that, you know, for example, in my own work with so-called Paleolithic art with a capital A, and whereas we call what Native Americans did rock art or petroglyphs, mm -hmm. you know, why is one thing mm -hmm. art with a capital A? I don't know, and what I've, I have, I have not engaged with the, the Trans Bay people. I want to get Portugal done. I'm a little concerned for some of the issues which were raised by some people here. I would like to get Portugal done and in the, into the galleries there before someone says, well, what are you doing with this? You can't take these materials out of the country. You can't do this. So I'm very aware, I'm very aware of the sensitivity, but I'm also trying to avoid a project being stopped. But the plan is to go back to the Trans Bay Transa Center and have a, another exhibition with this material and others. And I'm, I've, everyone I've spoken to is very excited about that, especially because this is not only archaeology, but it's something else. And it, people are, whether they hate it or they love it, people react to this. And I think sort of I was excited by doing that. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, well, I'm there. I mean, the Trans Bay Transit Center did excavate a native burial. Mm -hmm. So, the larger point that I'm asking about is that a, a critique, you know, of archaeological practice having to do with different value systems and you know, we're evaluating the very people or these yes. people and so on and so forth. Um, the, ironically, a lot of this is considered, you know, not worthy of mm -hmm. yeah. storage. And you're right, so the, all the leather shoes, we had a lot of leather, a lot of organics. Peop, I mean, people who got, who got part of their kit, they're like, whoa, yay. <laughs> and, then, and Colleen Morgan with putting the, the shoe on, I don't know if it's her child or someone else. Wow, I, don't, I, I have no expectation of, that's really, I don't know why that's very powerful to me, but it says something about these objects which were deemed to be unimportant and discardable for our reasons of historical valuation are actually full of energy and value. How do we release that? Probably not in the traditional way of doing archaeology. And that's what I'm trying, that's what this is about. Yes, sure. I just want to say, I'm sorry that lady left, but I started out thinking sort of like, like she did it very quickly. I moved into my age group and began downsizing. And I've been going through downsizing for the last year. And there's some other old people in this room today, so I will mention that because it's exactly what you go through. You cannot save everything, right. and you have different reasons, and they clash. Yeah. And it has to be done. And in the, there's an article coming out next year in a book about the slide dissolving project, where I talk a lot about archives. And there's a, an anthropologist called Liam Buckley, who wrote a very important article about. Um, the National Photographic uh, Archives in the Gambia, where he was doing his PhD research, and how they were all decaying, ants and mildew. And the whole article argues about maybe we need to value decay in a way in which we haven't. And he talks about local people where he was living 
Um, the man died, and the widow burned all his things. Didn't want to give them to the museum, didn't want to retain them. And her way of dealing with loss and life was to release them. And to value that moment of release and destruction is something positive. It is part of the cycle. Completely. And we're sort of, we're fooling with life when we're preserving stuff which should decay. Sorry. <laughs> we do all those burnt houses in the yes. Neolithic. It all comes back to Ruth, always. <laughs> yes. Sorry, yes. maybe out of magazines or newspaper mm. and carefully fold it up and then some of the names on these envelopes were like notable you know they, they were people in Wikipedia a famous lichenologist that had collected in the Philippines and had sent in their collections and all those envelopes get thrown into the trash mm. they are not valued at all it was just the li all about the lichens you know and I just I, I kept mm -hmm. a few because like oh I just can't you know, the beautiful handwriting mm -hmm. on them. So it just, you know, something about what you're talking about. Well, the issue of discard is a huge anthropological yes. debate. Go back to Danny Miller's work, Karen Dahl, some of you know her work, who's one of our students, did this amazing coat made out of clothes that had been thrown away, we had been sent to a recycling center. But there was the Goodwill deemed them not to be good enough to put in their shop. So they're, they're put in big bales and they're shipped to Africa where people wear these shirts. And there's this weird, valuation, which we don't often question. And I think that's an interesting way of thinking about this. We have all kinds of strange reasons to value what we should preserve or keep. And there was a show a few years ago, a friend of mine participated, uh, where they took guns that had been collected. Oh. I think it was in Oakland, and they disarticulated them. Mm -hmm. And then they had the uh, artists come up to these tables just full of stocks here and right. you know, triggers here. There's all these parts and they could take whatever they wanted and then refashion yes. them into an art piece. And the art pieces were very political, like the DNA spiral, mm. you know, yeah, made yeah. out of gun pieces or flowers made out of gun pieces. Anyway, right. all these yeah. ideas are floating in my mind from your show. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> which may be a good way to wrap up unless there are other questions. No, okay, well thank you very much. Thank you.